Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 47. Dear Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast listeners, welcome back to our educational podcast that brings you the latest in careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies straight from the experts. You are well aware that neuroscience research is incredibly specialized, which is why, according to many of our podcast guests, it's essential to expand your knowledge and to learn from the experiences of people from different science fields. As a faculty member teaching neuroscience-related courses at the University of North Florida, I'm particularly proud to present this week's guest from UNF, Dr. Quincy Gibson. Her love for dolphins has taken her around the world, from studying them in Australia and Hawaii to leading UNF's dolphin research program after 19 dolphins washed up on the shores of the St. John's River in 2010. Her work aims to improve the lives of Atlantic bottlenose dolphins in the St. John's River and to identify any ecosystem disturbances. Dr. Gibson is joining us today to share her fascinating research and career journey. I will dive into the studies of dolphins and whales, including their brains, sensory systems, communication, social systems, and so much more. We'll also explore the similarities and differences between these marine mammals and humans. Plus, we'll hear from Dr. Gibson about the unique dolphin sleep patterns where one hemisphere of the dolphin sleeps while the other remains active. Can you imagine that? As an accomplished researcher and faculty member, Dr. Gibson will also offer valuable advice for students and professionals looking to build careers in marine biology and neuroscience-related fields. So, prepare to be inspired by Dr. Gibson's insights and experiences. Let's get started and welcome Dr. Quincy Gibson to our show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I am the head of the University of North Florida's dolphin research team, but I'm also a professor in the biology department. So I do a combination of different jobs and tasks on a day-to-day basis. So I divide my time between teaching and research primarily. And as part of my research, I also do a lot of service to the community. So community outreach and education to teach people about the dolphins that we're hoping to protect and conserve. And so as a professor, every day is a little bit different for me. I get to divide my time the way that I see it as being important, which is a big perk to the job. And so I typically spend one day a week out on the research boat on the St. John's River to study these animals. And then the rest of the week is devoted to teaching or processing and analyzing data and writing papers or doing community outreach events. And so every day is a little bit different. And so I started the dolphin research program at UNF when I first got here in December of 2010. And the main reason, as you pointed out, was that we were having a lot of dolphins that were dying in the St. John's River, and nobody had been studying these animals for a long period of time. And so they didn't know what was going on or if there was a big problem that needed to be fixed to keep this from happening again. And so we started off just basically trying to figure out what was going on with these local animals. 
And as we continued our study over time, we started to find out some really fascinating facts about this particular population of dolphins. And we've now been studying them for over 11 years, and we know them on an individual basis. And we've been able to track some of these dolphins from when they were born all the way to when they have a first calf of their own. And so it's really incredible to be able to see these life stories in real time and to be able to follow them and be a voice for them when they have problems or when the environment is is not good for them. We're able to talk to the management agencies and provide the data that will hopefully make a difference um, and improve the lives for these animals. Thank you so much for your introduction. I already have so many questions, just, you know, starting <laughs> from this introduction. But uh, let's uh, to be consistent. And I want to ask first, how did this love for dolphins, whales develop? Why did you decide to enter this field? I'm one of those people that from a very early age just had a love for animals of all different types, but my favorite animal was always the bottlenose dolphin. And my parents claimed that when I was five years old, I told them that I was going to be a dolphin biologist. And I, I guarantee that I had no idea what that meant at the time. I didn't know what careers working with dolphins looked like or what was possible. Um, but as I continued my education, my love for animals continued. And so I pursued a degree, an undergraduate degree in zoology and psychology because my parents had taken me on a trip. It was to, it was a small marine park where you could see dolphins. I can't remember the name of it, but one of the dolphin trainers there had mentioned to my mom that you could go into this field with a degree in either biology or psychology. And so that triggered something in me. And when I got to the university, I decided to pursue both because it would open up multiple opportunities and I could go in either direction when I graduated. And so that combination of zoology and psychology, I think was a really great fit. And I highly recommend that even if students don't do double majors, they consider at least a minor. So if you're a psychology student, maybe a minor in biology, or if you're a biology major, maybe a minor in psychology, and that allows you to apply to a lot of different graduate programs that you may not have been eligible for otherwise. And so when I got to um, probably my junior year of undergraduate school, I started to look at what was next. And at that point, I still didn't realize that I wanted a PhD. I, did, I honestly didn't think I did. But when I looked at the types of careers that were available, I realized that having a graduate degree was going to open up some more doors um, that I needed open to get where I wanted to go. And so I was very fortunate. I applied to a number of different graduate programs. And the one that I ended up joining was at Georgetown University working with Dr. Janet Mann. And her research was all in Shark Bay, Western Australia. And I'd always wanted to go to Australia. And so it seemed like the perfect, like dream come true for me. And it was in a lot of ways. And so I was able to work with the experts in an incredible place where dolphins have been studied at that point for over 20 years. Now it's over, over 40 years. And so I was able to learn a lot and establish a lot of really valuable connections in the marine mammal field by working there. And then I continued on getting different jobs and eventually ended up here at the University of North Florida. Thank you so much. What, what a beautiful journey. Did you have any concerns of becoming a marine biologist in terms of what will your job involve? We talked a little bit before starting this podcast. I know some students that wanted to pursue this career, but they were kind of deferred from making this decision because they learned that the work primarily will include the work in the lab, not in the actual field and working with dolphins, with whales and doing the study in the open field. So what can you tell about that? Absolutely. So it's important to remember that as with any profession, there are a lot of different jobs that you can obtain in that field. And so for me, in particular, being a professor that's able to do research, it gives me a lot more flexibility than someone who's a marine mammal biologist for the government, for example. 
So I'll tell you a little bit about my sort of day-to-day experience, and then I'll give you another job as sort of a contrast to compare that to. So for me, like I mentioned before, I'm able to spend one day a week out on the boat for the entire day. So I'm a field biologist. I go out in a boat and I track these animals over time. We collect data and photographs. We know who the animals are. And so we're able to get a lot of information. And it, it's a hard job in a lot of ways because it's physically exhausting, especially being here in Florida during the summer. It can be over 100 degrees and humid and you're out on a boat with no shade for 10 hours at a time. And you're holding heavy cameras and and moving and doing things the entire time that you're out there. There's not like a downtime. You don't have a lunch break per se. So it's it's a physically grueling job, but at the same time, we I've been doing this for decades and I still get excited every single time we're out there. There's something new and interesting that the dolphins are doing that we didn't know about before. And so it's a pretty incredible opportunity. It's something where I occasionally have to pinch myself to say like, I actually get paid to be out here doing what I'm doing. And I know a lot of people would be doing it for free if they could. And so I feel very fortunate in the the role that I have at the university. But all of that data that we collect for every boat day that we're on the water, it takes me probably at least a week to just process the photo data. And so you have to spend a lot of time in front of the computer. But it's something where I think when you're first getting started, you see that computer time as not interesting and boring compared to the time that you're out in the field. But the longer you do it, I actually appreciate both equally because when I'm behind the computer and I'm looking at the data that we've collected, I can catch things and see things that I wasn't able to catch in real time. And you can start to put together those patterns and it becomes kind of like a detective game or a discovery. And when you're actually processing and analyzing those data and you see those numbers come back and they support, or maybe they don't, whatever your hypothesis was or what you thought was happening when you were out in the field, that is really exciting. And so I I think you kind of learn to appreciate both sides of the job, but you have to know that for every hour that you spend on the boat, there's going to be far more hours behind the computer taking in that information that you've collected. There's I can't think of any single job in the marine mammal field where you spend only time out on the water with the animals. You have to do something with the information that you're collecting. The only exception might be if you were working as a naturalist, for example, on a whale watching boat. Um, Those naturalists go out and they do community education. They may or may not collect data that they then hand off to a research group, but they're day in and day out. They're always out on the water. And so if you don't like that idea of doing data analysis and processing and writing papers, maybe something similar to a naturalist position would be a better fit for you. Just to compare sort of my day to day to another opportunity that I'm relatively familiar with. We collaborate with the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission here in Florida quite frequently. So in our area, they are the ones who respond to stranded marine mammals. So including manatees and dolphins and whales that wash up along our beaches or the banks of the river. And so their marine mammal biologists are basically on call. And so they have office time where they're writing up reports or processing documents or data that has been collected previously. But then anytime they get a phone call, they have to drop everything and go. And so they also do necropsies, which are animal autopsies, to try and figure out what the cause of death was for some of these animals. They assist with relocation. So for example, if a manatee gets trapped in the wrong place, they can relocate that manatee. They may drive an injured dolphin down to SeaWorld for rehabilitation. And so their day to day is very different than my day to day, but it's the same kind of breakdown where there's going to be a lot of time in the field, but there's also still going to be some computer time involved. On their side of things, it's probably a little less balanced. There's more time in the field than there is in the office at certain times of year, Um, but there's always going to be a mixture of those two. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And I hope this will clarify some of the questions from our students and will help them to decide which way they want to turn. The most important that you show that there are options. Yes, dependent mm-hmm. on how much time the person wants to spend in the field or in the lab. Mm-hmm. Some of them might just want to look into the data and this will be something they're interested in. So thank you. Thank you for that. Absolutely. You mentioned your degree in psychology and zoology, and you said that that can be really helpful uh, for people pursuing this type of professions. Can you maybe provide some specific examples how both of those fields complement each other in your work and how they're helping Mm -hmm. in things that you do? Absolutely. So I think it's not just specific to marine mammals, that that combination of biology and psychology is important, but anything related to animal behavior, you'll find that that combination is very helpful. So for example, my graduate program at Georgetown University my PhD mentor was in both departments. So she was a professor in the psychology department first and then was given a joint appointment in the biology department. And so she was doing both sides. And interestingly, when I was coming into the program, I had both the undergrad in biology and psychology. And so she asked me which department I wanted to go into. And I said, I didn't know any difference. So it was up to her. And she ultimately guided me into the biology program. The main reason being that when you think about PhD programs, you want to think about funding. And so getting stipends to support you as a graduate student, because the biology students were competing with med schools, that stipend was higher than the stipend was in the psychology department. And so financially, she said it was a better fit for me to go into the biology department. And so that sort of set me down the path that I've been on ever since. And so now I do actually consider myself more of a biologist than a psychologist, but there is quite a lot of overlap there. And so with animal behavior, there are different approaches, whether you're taking the biological side or the psychological side to studying animal behavior, but they all come back together. It's a highly integrated science. And so understanding why animals behave the way that they do, you can look at that from an evolutionary perspective, which is going to give you the biology side. You can look at it from a physiological perspective. What are the hormones involved? What are the sensory receptors involved? That's also biology. In some cases, you could claim that that's psychology as well, if you're thinking about the neuropsych part of it, but understanding sort of the way that the brain is organized and the way that decisions are made, that part is going to be more of the psychological side. And so having that complete perspective is really helpful for studying animal behavior and marine mammal behavior as well. Thank you so much. And you mentioned the mystery that you came actually to solve when you came to ENF. Can you tell more about that mystery and how did you solve it? What were the main steps in it? What did it involve? And maybe some major findings that you have after already 10 years after the mystery presented itself. Yeah. So when we first started, the dolphins had already been dying in the river and nobody knew what was happening. And the government created a working group of scientists to try and figure out what was going on. And that's right when I came to UNF. And unfortunately, because they didn't have any data before the die-off started, it was impossible for them to pinpoint the exact cause. We have a couple of hypotheses, one of which is that there was a dredging operation that was happening in the river at that time, and one of the particular dredge pipes went all the way across the river. And so the thinking of the experts on the group was that maybe the noise from that dredging pipe was enough to cause moms and calves to separate. So they might have gotten, um, like if a mom swam under the dredge pipe and a calf hesitated because it was scary, then maybe the mom was on one side and the calf was on the other, but because of the noise, they weren't able to find each other to reunite. 
because over 50% of the animals that were stranding were young calves. And so we think that there was something about that mother and calf separation. Other than that, there was also a fish kill around the same time. So a large die off of fish in the river. So there may have been other environmental contributors. So maybe a harmful algal bloom, something along those lines. But unfortunately, because they didn't have the data, they weren't able to definitively figure it out. But we started long-term monitoring at that point and accumulated a lot of information on these animals. And then in 2013, another die-off started happening. And this one wasn't limited to the St. John's River. It was all down the Atlantic coast of the United States. And something, I think it was over 1,800 dolphins that stranded during this time frame, 2013 to 2015. And it ended up being determined that it was due to a viral epidemic. So morbilla virus. We are now all intimately familiar with viral epidemics and we know how, how this plays out. But what was happening is that dolphins along the Atlantic coast are migratory. And so as the dolphins migrated south during the winter, they would spread that virus to the local populations in those southern areas. And so the coastal dolphins migrated south along the coast until they got to Florida, and then they passed that virus on to our dolphins that live in the estuaries in this area. And so unfortunately, we were one of the few places along the eastern seaboard of the United States where the virus made it into the estuary and had a very large impact on our animals. We were singled out by NOAA fisheries as being a hot spot. And so our animals were dying yet again. So within a very short time frame, we were having a second mass mortality event for dolphins in the St. John's River. But this time we had a lot of information. And so one of my graduate students just recently published her thesis as a manuscript um, in the journal Mammalian Biology, where it was looking at the spread of that virus and how it impacted the social behavior of the dolphins in the St. John's River, their social network pre, during, and post epidemic. And so interestingly, we were able to see how the virus was coming in through those coastal dolphins and then being spread to the animals that were in our area seasonally, and then they were spreading it to the animals that are here year round. And so we have the data to show how that moved between communities in this social system that we have in the St. John's River. So unfortunately, we didn't know what was going on with the first mass mortality event. The second mass mortality event, we knew exactly what was going on and we had a lot of detailed data. And we're able to, to show that to the management agencies, but unfortunately it's not yet feasible to vaccinate wild marine mammals. And so there's not much we can do about it but we are much better prepared for the next viral epidemic because we know how that spread is likely to happen in the future. And so that is useful information. So what we do is a lot of population monitoring, but we also do a lot of what we consider the sort of the fun side where we study the social behavior and the social complexity of these animals. So one of the coolest things about where I did my PhD research is that the dolphins in Shark Bay, Western Australia, form really complex alliances and multi-level alliances. And so what this means is it's a mating strategy on the part of male dolphins, where instead of trying to convince a female to mate with you as a single male, you go and you get your best friend and the two of you will guard that female and you will make sure that other males don't get access to her. So you're basically ensuring that the female chooses you when she's fertile and able to mate and produce offspring. And so the way that they take it to a whole new level is that these males don't just get their best friend, but they have teams of best friends. And so the first order male alliance is a male and his best friend or his two best friends. So it's a pair or a trio but then they also have an arrangement set up with another pair or trio that they can call in as reinforcements. And so it's a numbers game. So if you have your preferred female and you're guarding her and somebody comes and tries to steal her, you can call in your reinforcements and they will come and help you defend your female and keep her to yourself. And so that multi-level alliance structure is incredibly impressive. It's only been documented in humans and bottlenose dolphins. No other species of animal, including our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, are known to do this. 
that first order alliance, that's fairly common. We know a lot of animals do that. For example, African lions, even male turkeys form alliance partnerships where it's two males or three males that work together. But when you have that multi-level structure, it's very complex and it gets really interesting really quickly. And it's incredibly interesting from a scientific perspective to try and figure out why are we only seeing that in this animal and why are we only seeing it in certain populations of this animal? And so right now to date, it has only been documented in Shark Bay, Western Australia, bottlenose dolphins, and the bottlenose dolphins here in the St. Johns River in Florida. And a lot of people say, well, maybe they just haven't looked for it elsewhere, but that's not the case. We, everybody has been looking for it and they haven't found evidence of it. And our team here at UNF, we've also done analyses of the Indian River Lagoon dolphins, which are close to us. And we know that there is some mixing between the St. John's River dolphins and the Indian River Lagoon dolphins. They go back and forth. But yet our analyses show that in the Indian River Lagoon, they only form those pairs or trios. They don't actually form the multi-level alliances that we see very clearly here in the St. John's River. And so... Again, this is really fascinating to try and figure out what is it that's going on in the St. John's River that's causing these males to create these extremely complicated relationships and to figure this out. Um, and so that's been sort of a main area of study for our lab. And it's interesting from a psychological perspective, too, because if you think about the level of intelligence and cognitive abilities that are required to be able to form these multi-level alliances, it's really impressive. Because if you have a best friend and you guys are always together, you know what that relationship entails. But if you're calling in reinforcements to help you defeat a third group, you need to know that those reinforcements like you better than they like the, the other group that you're trying to compete against. And so having to monitor those third party relationships and keep track of who's close friends and who's not and how strong your relationship is compared to the relationship between two other groups, that is very cognitively demanding. And so having a large brain size and the ability to sort of navigate those complex relationships is what makes dolphins really fascinating to study. Yeah, thank you so much. It is a fascinating story. What hypothesis are you exploring to explain this, you know, very specific group behavior and not a widespread behavior? Yeah, it's. It's interesting because we've explored it from a lot of different perspectives and we've tested a couple of different hypotheses. And the biggest thing to note is that historically, people used to think maybe it was because Shark Bay is a very wide open bay. And so there's nowhere to hide. So if you are a male group that has a female, everyone else in the bay knows that you have that female because they can eavesdrop and hear what's going on. And they can basically come and interrupt you at any point in time. Whereas in places like, for example, Sarasota, Florida, which has had a long running dolphin research program as well, that habitat is much more fragmented and there's lots of little islands that they can sort of hide behind that maybe give them a little bit of the ability to be cryptic and to not let others know if you have a preferred female that everybody's interested in. And so the thought was for a very long time that it was habitat related. But by adding in the St. John's River as a comparison, we basically debunked that hypothesis because the St. John's River is very fragmented. There are lots of little tributaries and shoal islands that you can go behind. And there's no chance that a dolphin at the mouth of the river would be able to hear a dolphin that is upriver near downtown Jacksonville. And so having that fragmented habitat means that, that it's probably not habitat related. So what we are currently sort of thinking about as our primary hypothesis, and it seems to have a lot of support, is that it's more related to population density. How many competitors are packed into a certain area? And so in Shark Bay, there's a large number of dolphins and their density, I believe, is like two dolphins per kilometer squared. In the St. Johns River, our density is the highest that's been reported anywhere in the world. So we, on average, 
have over four to five dolphins per square kilometer. And in the summer months, we study a 40 kilometer area, which seems really tiny compared to other field sites. But yet we see more dolphins in that 40 kilometer study area than you see anywhere along the Florida coast. We have a lot of collaborators where we've teamed up and done surveys on the same day. And we basically start back to back. And we historically have the highest number of dolphins in our tiny little survey area compared to all of the other survey areas. And so we think what is going on is that we have this interesting population where we have year-round residents, we have seasonal residents that are coming up primarily from that Indian River Lagoon area or south of us, just in between the IRL and the St. John's River. Um, and then we also have the coastal dolphins. And so when these dolphins all come together, it's primarily in the summer months and summer is breeding season for bottlenose dolphins. And so during the winter, there's less competition. There's fewer dolphins around. Um, the seasonal residents are gone. The coastal dolphins are offshore and nobody's breeding. So it's pretty chill in the wintertime. But in the summertime, we basically double the population size. So you have those year-round residents. You have the seasonal animals come in. You have coastal animals coming in. And so there's intense competition for the few fertile females that are available. And so we think that is most likely explaining why we have this increased social complexity in the St. John's River. Yeah, that is amazing. And uh, what brings all those dolphins to St. John River? Like you said, you know, the, the density is very high compared to many other places. So what what is the catch? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, and we honestly don't know the answer. It's something that I've been thinking about since we first started, because when I came to UNF, I knew that I was going to start this dolphin research program. I knew we had the issues in the St. John's River with the, the dolphins dying, but I didn't know if I was going to study to the north, to the south of the river, and sort of where our field site was going to be. But it quickly became apparent that the dolphins like the St. John's River. That's where they are. So there are some to the north in the intercoastal waterway. There's some to the south in the intercoastal waterway. And we occasionally do research surveys in those areas. But when we do, we get nowhere near as many dolphin sightings as we do when we're running our surveys in the St. John's River. So there's something about this river that is attracting the animals. And I think most likely it's because it's a very productive estuary. There's a lot of fishermen that are successful when they're on the St. John's River. There's probably a good food supply to support this many dolphins. Whereas if you move into the intercoastal waterway, there may not be as abundant of a prey supply for them. But at the same time, there's a lot of trade-offs involved because there may be a greater quantity and quality of fish in the river but you also have a lot of risk factors to contend with. So there's a lot of boating activity. There's a lot of construction activity. Um, there's a lot of pollution in the St. John's. And so all of those factors are having a negative impact on the animals, but yet they keep coming back, which means that it is a critical or important habitat for them. And we just don't know all of the answers as to why it is so critical at this point. That is amazing that right here in Florida, we have, you know, the, the, one of the highest densities of dolphins, so, uh, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And how is this transition happening from salt water to more fresh water in the river? Yes, from the ocean to the river. Are there any mechanisms how dolphins adjust for that? So how how is this happening? Yeah, and that's actually a great question because we think it ties back to that first mortality event where the dolphins were maybe getting trapped on the wrong side of that dredge pipe. And if they spent too much time in fresh water, it can cause physiological problems for them. So dolphins have evolved to live in a saltwater environment, but they can handle short periods of time in freshwater. And with the St. John's River estuary, the salinity fluctuates depending on where you are and what the tidal state is. So whether it's an incoming tide or an outgoing tide. So if you're at the mouth of the river, it's basically salt water. It's like being in the ocean. The dolphins are totally comfortable and fine there. But 
for our year-round residents, we've noted over time that most of them spend more of their time farther upriver than the seasonal residents do. And so it's like when all of those newcomers come into the river during the summer month, the year-round dolphins are like, let's move further upriver to get out of the way. And so when they do that, they start to spend more time in freshwater. One of the first signs of spending too much time in freshwater is that they get skin lesions. And so their skin starts to break down because their skin is also designed for salt water. And so that ion balance is out of skew when they spend too much time in freshwater. The skin starts to break down. They can get secondary infections because it's like once you have a cut, it's open to any bacteria or fungi that you may come in contact with. And then they also start to have problems with their kidneys and they can get brain issues as well. So their nervous system starts to not function optimally. And so they make bad choices and they may spend even more time in fresh water. And so we have seen some indication that this does happen in the St. John's River, but in our area and other areas, um, for example, in Louisiana, where there's a lot of floods after hurricanes, there's been a few researchers that have hypothesized that maybe these dolphins are adapted to these salinity fluctuations a bit better than dolphins that live along the coast and don't experience this. But to be honest, our dolphins have a number of health issues. And so it would be really challenging to try and pinpoint exactly what is caused by salinity versus pollution or prey quality issues or any number of stress-related issues. And so it all, it's like a, a perfect storm. They all accumulate together and it creates sort of a overall health decline for the animals. But in general, as long as they're moving back and forth between the high salinity and low salinity areas, the salinity shouldn't be a problem for them. It's just if they spend too much time in that fresh water that they start to have problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And you mentioned this complex behavior of dolphins and their big brain. Mm -hmm. as we're in our NeuroCareers podcast. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. And what are the main differences between the human brain and dolphin brain? What separates them from our brain? Okay. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> question, but I will preface that by saying that I am not an anatomy professor. So <laughs> I don't have all the details, but I can give you sort of the general overview. So starting, we'll take a step back. When you think about intelligence and you're trying to compare intelligence for different species of animals, one of the things that you look at is brain size relative to body size. And that is because you can't give an intelligence test to like an elephant that you would give to a dolphin and that you would give to a human. They're obviously intelligent in very different ways. And so having a sort of quantitative measure to be able to assess what is the excess amount of brain that they have available for cognitive tasks. The reason that we do that is for a given body size, you have to have a brain of a certain size to be able to power and control that body. But if your brain is larger than average for that body size, that is energetically expensive to maintain. Brains are very costly organs. And so over evolutionary time, if these animals have much larger brains than predicted for their body size, that indicates that there's a reason for it. There's a function for it. And so historically, there's sort of two different camps that researchers fall into in terms of explaining why dolphins have such large brains for their body size. One is that it's for social complexity, that they have these incredibly rich social lives and they need to have the cognitive ability to sort of track those social relationships and learn to, to fit into those societies. The other camp that researchers fall into is that it's because of their foraging complexity. So dolphins have this additional sensory ability that you and I do not possess. They have the ability to echolocate and to use sound to basically see objects in their environment. And so having to process that information and to be able to forage and hunt using sound instead of sight in a novel way may be driving increased brain size as well. And so 
most researchers now, I think, are kind of combining those two and saying it's probably not one or the other. It's probably all of this combined. And we take more of a holistic approach. And when it comes to brain size relative to predicted body size, dolphins are second only to human. So when you do these measurements, it's called an encephalization quotient or an encephalization level. Humans on average are roughly seven and a half, I believe. Dolphins on average are around four and a half and chimpanzees are down at three. And so they do have these excessively large brains for their body size, and they're structured a bit differently than ours. For example, the cerebellum, the base of the brain, is responsible for motor movement primarily or being able to sort of navigate motor abilities. And those are much, much larger than you would expect based on their body size. And so we think that's because they're in a three-dimensional environment. So they go up, down, sideways, they do flips, they leap out of the water. And so having much more complicated physical movements and being able to navigate that three-dimensional environment requires a much larger cerebellum than what you and I have. We also see that it's much more convoluted. Their brains are structured a little bit differently than ours. Um, but in general, they have excessively large brains for their body size. And the question is, what are they using those large brains for? The other cool thing about dolphin brains is that when they need to sleep, they don't sleep with both hemispheres at the same time. So they are voluntary breathers, meaning that they have to actually think about coming to the surface to take a breath. And so when they are sleeping, they do that with one hemisphere at a time and the opposite eye is closed. So when you're with a sleeping dolphin, you can tell which hemisphere is sleeping at that point in time. And often in Shark Bay, we could put our boat in the middle and they would just swim in a circle around it because they keep the eye that's open on the outside to look for approaching danger and predators. And the eye that's closed is on the inside of the circle. And so they would just circle the boat that way, which is really fascinating to see. But they have to stay some level of alert all the time in order to, to prevent danger. It could be approaching predators, it could be avoiding a passing vessel, it could be lots of different things, but the way that they sleep is very different than us, and they're able to separate those two hemispheres to be able to do that. Yeah, this is amazing. I, I think this was the first thing that interested me in um, neuroscience. Uh, it was many years ago, but this information was already available. And I thought, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. And I was very curious. Actually, this was one of the questions to you. Do we know something more about this? You mm -hmm. know, is it still uh, true? You know, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, is this the same with whales as with dolphins or there are some differences? So there's an interesting history to that. And the way that we know the answer to these questions is because dolphins have been kept in captivity where you can study them very closely and monitor them with electrodes and figure out what's going on. Uh, with larger whale species, they've never been successfully managed in captivity. And so we can't do the same types of studies on a humpback whale that we can do on a bottlenose dolphin. And so historically, the U.S. Navy had a pretty interesting research program where they were, I believe they were the ones who discovered the sleep. Um, and the way that it sort of came about is they were trying to put a dolphin under anesthesia to do some other type of experiment. But every time they would put it under anesthesia, it would just stop breathing and they would have to resuscitate it. And so that, that's how they realized that the voluntary breathing was a factor. And that they were shutting down the brain with the anesthesia. And so they were no longer taking that breath. And so that led to follow-up studies. And that's where they investigated sleep, I believe. And so things are, we're in a very different place in the world now than we were back then. And so ethically, a lot of the studies that were conducted are no longer possible. Uh, for good reason. And so I, I don't know that anybody is doing follow-up studies in that area necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. And now what you said about the echolocation, that the big part of the brain is responsible for echolocation. 
And this is how dolphins forage and also communicate with each other. So as I understand, uh, like you mentioned, they can ease drops on, mm-hmm. on, on each other. So, so they, they can get into other dolphins' yeah. conversations and p- pick up the information from there. And also... This might have been one of the reasons why the calves were separated, yes, from mom in your mystery case, in your first mystery mm-hmm. case in Florida, because they just couldn't hear the moms uh, echolocate them due to the noise in the environment. Yes. So can you talk uh, more about that and about the soundscapes that you are trying to Mm -hmm. create for the river and see if this is a real hazard to the dolphins? Absolutely. So sound is incredibly important to marine mammals, and it is even more so in habitats like the St. John's River, where there's a lot of tannins and the water visibility is next to zero. So if you stuck your hand in the water, you wouldn't be able to see your fingers. It's that dark. And so the dolphins are not able to rely on eyesight to be able to find one another or find the food that they need to survive or to even see approaching boats that are coming towards them. And so everything comes back to sound. And so when we think about the way that dolphins use sound, there's different categories of sounds. So echolocation is a very specific category, and it is primarily used for detecting objects in the environment, including food, but also objects like a physical structure, like a rock or a dock or a boat, whatever it may be. And so the way that that is sort of carried out is that the dolphin produces their own clicks, their own noises, and it actually comes out of the nasal passages, which are in their blowhole. And so just beneath the blowhole, they have this convoluted series of nasal passages where they it's under muscle control, and they can create those sounds that are pushed past this little structure that vibrates, and it creates those clicks, and they can control how quickly those clicks are repeated. And so when they release those echolocation clicks, they go out into the environment, they make contact with a structure and then bounce back. And so that's the echo. So when that sound is bounced back to the animal, it's actually received in their lower jaw. So it doesn't go straight into their ears. Dolphins don't have external ears the way that you and I do. They don't have penne because they're very streamlined. Their body is smooth as can be. And so they have a little pinhole, but that's not actually where the sound comes in. The sound comes in through these hollow portions of their lower jawbone, and there's a fatty pad there that helps to amplify the sounds and send them straight into the middle ear where it's been passed on to the nervous system. And so they have this direct pathway where they're able to receive the sound in a very different way. When it comes to the communication side of things, they use a different style of sound production. So instead of echolocation clicks, they use what are called whistles. And so it's still up for debate exactly how the whistles are produced, but most people believe that it's probably produced in the nasal passages, very similar to the echolocation clicks. It's just they're structuring that the way that the sound moves past this ridge structure a little bit differently to create these frequency modulated whistles instead of just rapid fire, click, 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 click. And so when they do this, it's interesting because the research has shown that each dolphin will produce its signature whistle and its signature whistle is thought to function like a name. And so the dolphins will produce their whistle as a way of saying, hey, I'm here, or this is this is who I am kind of a thing. And so they do it often when they greet other groups of dolphins, they'll produce their signature whistle. But from a research perspective, the way that you can identify which whistle is the dolphin's signature whistle is it's the whistle that they most frequently produce. And so if you record them over a long period of time, the whistle that you see most frequently is going to be their signature whistle. And there's a lot of research that's been done on how these whistles come to be the way that they are. There seems to be some relationship between mothers and offspring. So in dolphin society, if you are a daughter, you get to stay with your mom and her social network for your entire life. You never get kicked out. And so their signature whistles actually are a little bit different. So mother and daughter will have slightly different signature whistles, and that allows the group to be able to distinguish between the mother and the daughter. But sons 
it was very similar. For a long period of time, we thought that sons kept the signature whistle of their mother. And that was important because at weaning, when the mother stops providing milk to his to the son, he gets kicked out of the social group. And so he has to go negotiate life on his own at that point. But dolphin groups will sort of join and leave and come back together. And so when her son comes back, the fact that he has a very similar, if not the same signature whistle to her, tells the mom and all of her associates that they're related. And so it was thought to be a mechanism to help avoid inbreeding. And so if a mom has like seven calves in her life, the seventh calf has no idea who was born before it, if it hasn't been spending a lot of time with the mom. And that's the case for males. And so if that signature whistle sounds familiar to that calf, it can automatically know, oh, that's a family member. And so they can sort of avoid those inbreeding relationships that way. Thank you. And can you tell about the research you do to look for those noise levels in the river? And why is it important? Yes, absolutely. I forgot to answer that. I apologize. So I had a graduate student several years ago that was really interested in sound levels in the river. And her initial hypothesis was that there were going to be areas where it would be relatively quiet and areas where it would be relatively loud. And that the dolphins, when they were resting or socializing, would prefer those quieter areas. And so that was sort of our premise for her thesis research. And much to our surprise, when we started collecting the sound recordings, we realized there weren't any quiet areas. The entire river was very noisy and very loud, much louder than we thought it was going to be. And so she did, um, she basically created a grid and it was 500 square feet for each grid. And she dropped a hydrophone in and made two minute recordings. And she did this repeatedly. And all of them were extremely loud. The mouth of the river, downtown Jacksonville, everywhere in between. And so that sort of shifted our focus. We no longer were looking for, oh, do they use the quiet areas more often for certain behavior states? But we were trying to figure out how do they negotiate this high sound level in general? Like, how are they still alive? How are they able to handle this? And so what we have noticed recently is, unfortunately, there's been a large spike in boat um, impacts to dolphins. And we think that the reason for that is a lot of people when they're out on the water, just assume that dolphins are going to dive or get out of their way when their boat is coming straight at them. And they will just keep going at full speed ahead, if it, even if the dolphins are right in front of them. And the problem is that we are in such a noisy habitat that the dolphins are basically having the problem of separating out the noise of an approaching boat from all of the other noise that is around them constantly. And so it's some, a phenomenon that we call masking. And so the sound of the boat is masked by all of the other human caused noise in the river. And so the dolphins may eventually be able to get out of the way of the boat, but it takes them some time before they're able to figure out, number one, that there is a new sound mixed in with all of the other sounds and to figure out where it's coming from, to be able to determine which direction that boat is approaching from. Because again, they can't rely on their eyesight because the water clarity is non-existent. And so we think that has become a major problem just a lot of it is partially human behavior in the sense that humans take it for granted that the dolphins will get out of their way rather than slowing down or attempting to drive around them, for example. The other factor that we think is at play is that there's a lot of stress. So being in a noisy environment all the time is going to take its toll on you emotionally, psychologically. And so these animals are probably under quite a bit of stress from that. If you add on to it the stress of having to move out of the way of boats when you're in the middle of foraging or socializing, um, all of the human activity that's on the water, there's probably quite a few stressors and that is accumulating 
and noise is just one component of it. But as we talked about previously, physiological stress can cause physiological health declines. And so these animals, the fact that they have those extensive skin lesions all over their body, maybe because partly that they're in fresh water more than they should be, but it could also be because they're under a lot of physiological stress and noise is probably contributing to that. And so we think this noisy habitat, even though they need to be there for whatever reason, probably prey related, it's probably not the healthiest of habitats for them. And the noise is a a big contributor to that. Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. It's difficult to imagine that, you know, in the river, which is a, a very long river, there's always, always high level of noise. Yeah, so there are no peaks when it's calm, calmer or louder, but it, it exists all the time and affects definitely dolphins. Mm-hmm. In terms of dolphins' brain. We already talked that there is a big area responsible for echolocation. Also, auditory function, yes, is is important. Uh, Probably a lot of brain allocated to that function as well. Uh, So, which usually means that some other sensory modalities are not as developed as maybe another species. Um, talking about visual system, uh, let's say somatosensory maybe system. Can you provide any maybe comparison with other animals or with humans in terms of those other sensory modalities in dolphins? Yeah, it's an interesting question because you would expect that. So if they are relying so heavily on sound that hearing would be their primary sensory modality, which is the case, but we don't necessarily see a decline in the other sensory modalities. So for example, with vision, that's probably the next one that's been heavily studied in bottlenose dolphins. They can see equal to us above the surface. So vision underwater is very different than vision above the water because of the way that the cornea is involved with the refraction of light waves coming from air versus water. So when they're above water, they are able to see comparable to humans. When they are below water, they can see better than us. And the partial reason for that is the the structure that they have for the cornea. It's very different than ours. Ours is curved and rounded, and that enables refraction in air, going from air to a liquid environment or liquid tissue environment inside the eye. With the dolphins, it's going usually from water to to liquid tissue. And so that curvature would actually cause too much refraction. And so their corneas are a bit flatter than ours. They also have this little structure that controls for the amount of light. It's called the operculum. So with human eyes, we have the pupil that is able to constrict, the iris constricts to make the pupil size smaller, and that controls the amount of light coming into the retina. With dolphins, they have this operculum that creates sort of two distinct pupils, and it creates two pinholes of light that are coming in and hitting the retina in two distinct locations. And so it's quite a bit different than us. But if you think about it, when they're submerged and below the surface, there's quite a bit less light available. And so typically they're going to have sort of everything set up to maximize all of that light coming in. But it's when they come to the surface that it becomes a problem and they have to restrict that available light. Yeah, so um, definitely some differences in uh, sensory modalities, although some similarities as well, but they're adopted to uh, to live in, in water. What about their cognitive functions, their behavior? You already mentioned that they exhibit very complex behavior that is seen only in humans. What about their communication? Is there any evidence that they have language as we can define it as language? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of different research groups that are focusing on different areas related to that topic. So for example, Denise Hertzing's research group out of Florida Atlantic University, they study the dolphins in the Bahamas. And the way that they study them is quite a bit different, but they swim with them and record them. Both visual and auditory information is collected. 
And so they've been doing that for about 30 years. And they've basically created a catalog of different sounds that seem to be associated with specific behaviors. And so they're starting to get to the point where they're trying to put together kind of like a dolphin dictionary where you can figure out like, oh, when dolphin does this behavior, it makes this sound. When it does this behavior, it makes this sound. And so they're they're trying to link that together. And so there may be some really big advances in the next couple of years. It just remains to be seen what types of data is, is coming out of that. But we're much further along than we were before. We know that they are using sound symbolically. And that is really cool to know. We also know that dolphins are capable of mirror self-recognition. There's been a lot of studies by Diana Reese, a researcher, I believe she's in New York, but she has done um, mirror tests with dolphins where she marks their body and then they will come and inspect themselves and, and try to figure out what's going on with their, their new mark that they have on their body. Whereas if you do a fake mark, the dolphins will come over and look for it and then when they find that it's not there, they they lose interest really quickly. And so self-recognition is sort of one of those hallmark tests that you use to indicate intelligence in an animal. So for example, elephants are capable of it, but dogs and cats are not. There's been a lot of problem-solving tests. There was a researcher named Stan Kuchai, who used to be at the University of Southern Mississippi. And he did studies where the dolphins were presented with something that they wanted, like a, a fish or something, but it, it, it was in like a puzzle box or in some type of convoluted PVC arrangement where they had to figure out how to get it out of there. And so the problem solving capabilities were really impressive. Um, there were a lot of studies at the University of Hawaii with Dr. Lou Herman and Adam Pack, where they were looking at symbolic language and syntax. And so they were able to determine that if you told the dolphin to go bring the ball to the surfboard, that meant something different than bring the surfboard to the ball. And so they were capable of both symbolic language and syntax, the way that you structure those, those words together and how it has meaning. And so every study that's been done related to different ways that you can measure intelligence in dolphins, it's always come back that they're much more intelligent than we gave them credit for previously. And so I, I personally believe that they are on par with human intelligence and they just are aquatic humans living out these really complex social lives. Yes, absolutely. And that was my next question about their very complex social lives. Like in one of the interviews, you said that oh, you cannot really consider one dolphin. Yes, it's it's a group. Mm -hmm. And their social behavior is very complex, very intricate. Uh, what are like, the main features of that complex social behavior. And then I will ask the, the next question also social, okay. but already more related to humans. So, but yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to dolphins, one of the common misconceptions that I hear really frequently is that they travel around in family pods. And that is not 100% accurate. So dolphin society, if you picture what your day-to-day -day life is like, that is what is happening in dolphin society. They have a social system that is called fission fusion. So fission meaning to break apart, fusion meaning come back together. And it is individual-based fission fusion. So each individual dolphin, just like an individual human, goes about their day-to-day -day life, joins certain groups at certain times, leaves those groups, joins other groups, leaves those groups, and forms new ones. And so each individual dolphin is capable of making those decisions and choices on their own. And they do that very flexibly. It's a very fluid society. So maybe you have an individual dolphin that prefers to forage on their own so that they don't have to compete with other dolphins. They'll go do that for an hour or two. Then when they're done foraging, they're ready to socialize. They'll go seek out some partners to play with and they'll spend an hour or two doing that. But if somebody they don't like comes into that socializing group, they're just as likely to leave and go find a different group or go do something else. They have very clear individual preferences and likes and dislikes for certain individuals. And you can see this once you know these animals in real time, 
and can recognize them when you're out on the water, you can watch this play out. And it looks very much like a soap opera with humans. There are very strong preferences and you start to know like there are certain dolphins that are highly social. There are certain dolphins that would rather be by themselves most of the time. There are some dolphins that are really aggressive and pick fights a lot. There are other dolphins that seem to be really calm and gentle and everybody seeks them out as like a comforting sort of um, relationship. And it's extremely similar to human behavior because they have that capacity to join and lead these groups. It doesn't mean that they're by themselves. They do have strong preferences. So if you are a female dolphin, you are most likely going to spend a lot of your time with your female relatives, your daughters, your aunts, your cousins, anyone that you sort of been exposed to as part of your mother's social network when you're growing up becomes part of your social network as an adult. If you are a male dolphin, on the other hand, life is very different. When you are with your mom, you're exposed to her social network, all of her friends and all of their kids, all of your aunts and, and female relatives. But then once you get weaned, you're kicked out of that social group but you don't leave the area. You stay in the same area that you're born. You just socially don't interact with your mother and her network anymore, for the most part. You can come back every once in a while to check in, but you're not going to spend a lot of time with them. And so those male dolphins have it quite rough when they're in that sort of little teenage um, session of life. And so they seek out other teenage males and they will form these juvenile groups where they basically learn to be independent adult dolphins and learn how to fit into this new society. And so those males, over time, they start to establish strong bonds with certain individuals, and that's how those male alliances form. So they don't start off at age three or four knowing who their male alliance partner is going to be when they're an adult. It forms over time, and it's usually through that juvenile stage where they're sort of negotiating all of those social relationships and learning how to fit into society that you'll start to see them pair off over time. And we have the data to show that there's a couple of dolphins that I can think of off the top of my head here where we've watched them over time and they've solidified this relationship. And now they're a very solid male alliance pair that's guarding female dolphins. And so we've, we've watched them strengthen that bond. And so very different lifestyle for males versus female dolphins, but it's fairly common for us to go out on the water and see just one or two dolphins hanging out by themselves, but we could also go out and see a group of 50 dolphins. But if it's a group of 50 dolphins, you can guarantee all 50 dolphins are not going to be together for five hours straight. It's usually a short-lived interaction, whereas they could very well spend three to five hours by themselves and then seek out social interaction later on. Yeah, so they have community gatherings. They do. <laughs> yes, parties. <laughs> parties on the river. <laughs> That's amazing. And uh, my next question is about the social interaction with humans. So we have so many legends and stories. Yes, how dolphins were saving humans, about the beautiful interactions. There are, I think, some programs that are helping children with the autism spectrum mm -hmm. to heal in a way, uh, have some therapeutic effect, uh, swimming with dolphins and, and so on and so forth. So what can you tell us? What are the myths? What are the misconceptions? And what is really happening with this dolphin to human interaction? I would probably start that conversation by saying it's important to remember that they are individuals, just like humans are individuals. And so just like there are some good humans and some not so good humans, the same is true for dolphins. And so you have to take each one of them on an individual basis. You can't make the assumption that all dolphins are good and want to seek contact with humans and would be happy to swim around with you holding on to their dorsal fin. That's simply not the case. And so I always caution people to remember that it's a wild animal. It's not just a wild animal. It's also a top predator. And so you would be very unlikely to put your child in a cage with a lion or a tiger, but people are very willing to put their child in a pool with a dolphin. 
And I, I caution against that because even though there are some dolphins that will be perfectly fine and would love to interact in a very calm and gentle manner with you, you never know, right? It's the same. I mean, if we think about pet dogs, right? There are certain dogs that have been family pets for years and then just have a random bad day and, and things go really wrong. The same thing can happen with dolphins. And so if you're doing those swim with programs, I think it's really important to do your research and pick a facility where they allow the animals freedom of choice, where they can choose whether or not they want to participate that day. And that is really crucial to making sure that things don't go really badly. Otherwise, if you're thinking about interactions with wild dolphins, I can tell you from experience because I've spent most of my adult life in close proximity to them. And working in Shark Bay, we had dolphins that would come up to the shoreline to be fed by humans. Um, they've been trained over generations to do this behavior. And there's one in particular that's extremely well known where she will bite you. If you get close to her, she is going to bite you. And we knew her well enough to know that if she came close, you get out of the water, you move. But there were other dolphins where they would just come and nuzzle you as you're like working on the boat. They would just nuzzle your legs and just hang out next to you and were very sweet and gentle. And so it's all individual basis. And so all of those stories about dolphins rescuing humans at sea, entirely plausible, but it just because one dolphin did that does not necessarily mean that all of them would do that. And so it's kind of hit or miss whether you get lucky and, and interact with the nice dolphin or the not so nice dolphin. And you, there's really no way to know. There's no way to predict that. Yeah. And you have exposure to all those personalities. Yes, almost 300 mm -hmm. dolphins that you are looking at and learning about in St. John's River. Can you tell about uh, their personalities? Maybe, you know, some story that really touched you or that was particularly interesting to you. Something about your interaction with, uh, with dolphins. Absolutely. So we're actually close to, I think, almost 600 dolphins that we have in our catalog now. And it increases every year because we have new calves being born every year. And so we have so many dolphins that we've been tracking. But there are those that we know really well compared to some of the others. And so we see them consistently over time. I'll give you one of my sort of favorite interactions. And it's a dolphin that we just saw this past Friday. And he's one of those that we've been tracking for a very long period of time. His name is Spartacus and he is an adult male. And very early on in our study, it was back in 2011, we noticed that he had an entanglement. It's fishing gear wrapped around the base of his flukes. And so we reported it to our partners at Fish and Wildlife and NOAA Fisheries um, Stranding Response Team. And they all had the veterinarians review it and they thought that it was potentially a life-threatening entanglement. And so they gathered up teams, I believe it was teams from eight different organizations, including us, to try and capture him and remove the entanglement, and then he would be released back into the river. And so we basically went out, and because it's our study area, I know the animal really well, I was responsible for tracking him. And so I was standing on the bow of a boat, following him around all day long. And he would hang out right next to me, right at the bow of the boat. He would look up at me. We make eye contact all the time. And you could tell he was like, why are you still here? Like, what are you doing? Um, and then when he would get into an area of the river where the other teams thought that they could deploy a net to try and catch him, he would always outsmart them and he would just dive below the net as they were setting it every single time they tried it. And then he would just come over and hang out next to my boat. And it's like, he knew me, he recognized our boat. And so he was just like, I don't know what they're doing. He's like, why are these humans trying to catch me in this net? And so it was a kind of comical, but also frustrating at the same time, because you wish you could just tell them like, hey, we're trying to help you. Can you please hold still or, or go into this net for a couple of minutes? Um, but we did this for two days straight and we tried to capture him multiple times. And every single time he would outsmart us and just come back over. 
And so it formed this relationship where we were worried about him. But at the same time, we're like, you're just so smart. You're, it's just impressive to see you and, and know about your day-to-day life. And so we've been able to track him and I'm very happy to report that it ended up not being a life-threatening entanglement and he is thriving. He's doing really well. He has an alliance partner. His alliance partner is Calypso and they've strengthened their bond over the past couple of years. And we just saw him guarding one of our very well-known females, Naya, on Friday. And so maybe he'll be making some babies for, for next summer that we'll be documenting. And so just, they all have individual personalities. They're all really interesting. Like Naya's kids, for example, for whatever reason, she has really spunky calves that like to approach boats. So they're very risk-taking little guys. And so her calves, we always know that you have to be super cautious around her because those kids are going to come and check you out and, and play around the research boat. Um, And then there are other moms that are much more protective and don't let their calves out of their sight. And they'll they'll try to keep their distance and always put their bodies in between you. But they all, they do have very distinct personalities and you get to know them as individuals over time, which is part of the fun. Yes, that is absolutely amazing. All those different personalities and also the ways to outsmart humans. And I'm sure Mm -hmm. not only humans, but other dolphins as well, which is a a sign of Mm -hmm. intelligence again. Um, Yes, that's beautiful. And do they form a bond between the female and male uh, for a lasting period of time or it's similar to the whales uh, who don't form those uh, close bonds? How is it with dolphins? It's interesting because it seems to differ, again, on an individual basis. There are some females that are very successful mothers and seem to be very attractive to males. It's almost like the males keep track of which females are successful at mothering. And so those females, um, they get treated with a bit more respect, if you can call it that. So the males tend to be less aggressive with them. But we know from research in Shark Bay that the younger females, the inexperienced females, the males tend to be a little bit more forceful and aggressive with them. But we don't see them forming long-term bonds. It may be that the males are, are guarding them for a week at a time. In some cases, I think the longest documented was about three months where the males stayed with a female. Um, but during that time frame, there's obviously social interactions and bonds are forming, but it may not be that they're sort of the female is preferring that particular male pair. She may have other pairs that she would prefer to be with instead. And so we don't yet know all the details of how they navigate that, but we do have anecdotal reports where we've seen it where a female is being guarded by males and another female will come distract them and the first female leaves and she gets out of there. So they sort of rescue each other (laughs) when they get into situations where they don't want to be there. So it's a very complex society and they all are forming relationships and those relationships are going to differ on an individual basis, but we don't see like a pair bond forming between a female and her mating partners, but they probably do socialize a bit to kind of work out who's preferred and who's not preferred. What is the most unexpected thing that you learned about dolphins throughout the years of your work with them? Um, There are lots of things. And I I would like to say that the male alliance complexity that we have in the St. John's River was a huge shock. And I was very excited to find that. Another thing that I found really surprising, and it's my favorite finding from my PhD research, was that maternal social patterns influence the social patterns of your calves. So just like if you are a highly social mom and you have highly social kids, there's something genetic or hereditary about that. And there may be environmental factors that are contributing as well. So the way that you socialize your child early on. And so we see that happening with dolphins too, but there's a very clear sex difference. So if you are the daughter of a highly social mom, you are likely to become highly social as well. But if you are the son of a highly social mom, you do the opposite. You become more 
sort of towards the solitary end of the continuum. And so they're basically compensating for whatever they don't get when they're with their mom, if they're a male. But if they're female, they get to hang out with mom the rest of their lives. And so whatever mom's doing works for her. So it's going to work for the daughter too. But the males, because they have to separate from mom, they're trying to compensate and get that opposite experience. And so if they've been heavily socialized with mom, they when they split away from her, they use that time to develop other skills and learn how to navigate the habitat and forage successfully. Whereas if their mom was solitary when they were a calf, when they separate from mom, they go out and they need to get those social skills pretty quickly. And so they become little social butterflies and, and forage less than, than their counterparts do. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. And what is the biggest problem that people doing research with dolphins are trying to solve at the moment? That is a good question. And I think it would differ depending on who you ask. But I think right now, the biggest sort of large scale question is how do we conserve these populations? Habitats are changing very rapidly. We have climate change that is sort of unpredictable in terms of how it's going to impact these animals. And so trying to figure out what we can do to conserve sort of viable populations of dolphins that will be here for generations to come. And so figuring out what all of those stressors are and how we can mitigate some of those risks to help the animals. How do you see the future of this research? Where is it heading? Dolphin marine biology. Yeah, so I think there's been a lot of technological advances over the past few years. And so that has been a big area of growth. For example, in Hawaii, I know some of my former collaborators are using drone photography to be able to calculate body condition for humpback whales at the start of their migration versus at the end of it. There's a lot of new tagging studies that are coming out because tags are getting more technologically advanced. And so there's a lot of different types of data that we're able to collect now that we weren't previously able to collect. And so I think it's going to open some, some windows and some information um, that will lead to additional types of studies in the future. And so it's a pretty big area of growth at the moment. Yes, that was one of my questions. Uh, you know, what became possible with the development of the technology in this research that wasn't possible before mm -hmm. uh, the technology was developed? Yeah, and the unfortunate thing, so the drone use for body condition studies is really attractive and would be really interesting for us to do. But in the St. John's River, as um, most locals will know, there are military bases and there's an airport. And so the airspace is restricted. And so unfortunately, we can't fly the drones in our normal study area. So that's a method that is eluding us at this point in time. But perhaps we can find an alternative that will be viable. Yes, absolutely. And what are your future plans for research with dolphins? So the way that our program runs at the University of North Florida is every time I take on a new graduate student, we start to ask new questions. And so it comes down to what is that student's area of interest and what would they like to know about the St. John's River Dolphins? So for example, I have a new graduate student coming on in the fall and she is really interested in looking at that population density aspect of male alliance formation. And so we're going to start to do some more thorough analyses looking at population abundance at different times of the year and whether or not that density is contributing to how often those multi-level male alliances are spending together versus apart. And so seeing how that all sort of integrates together. Um, but I have another graduate student that's really interested in the foraging behavior of the dolphins. And so we're starting to look at body condition by examining the stranded dolphins in the river and assessing their stomach contents to see what they've been eating and the quality of those prey items. Um, and then also comparing their foraging location. So where are they hunting for food and has that shifted over the past 10 years because we've had that big Jacksport expansion project. And so we're wondering if the changes to the habitat have caused changes in where the animals are looking for their prey. 
And so a couple of different areas that we're focusing on right now, but we always keep that social complexity um, as sort of our, our core area of study. And so we're monitoring those relationships between the male alliances and the reproductive success of the females and how that all ties together. And it's so good that you mentioned students that are joining you. Can you tell just, you know, a couple of words about what do you look in those students? What are skills, uh, qualities that they need to possess to be able to work with you? Yeah, so I think every professor looks for a slightly different combination of traits and abilities in their graduate students. For me personally, just based on the way that we collect our data, I need somebody that is comfortable being out on the water for long periods of time. They don't necessarily have to have boat driving experience, but some indication that they're not going to get seasick every day would be nice. I also look for students that are really good writers, because if you are doing science, the goal is to communicate it at the end and to share your findings with others. And so if you're a good writer, I can train you on the science aspects. And so we can produce those papers and manuscripts to be really effective forms of of sharing our our data. And so good writing, um, if you have prior experience doing some type of research, it doesn't necessarily have to be marine mammal research, but showing that you're familiar with the scientific process and understand sort of how it takes a a very detail-oriented person to be able to manage data and process it and analyze it and not make a lot of silly mistakes. And so having that prior experience is usually very helpful for when they get started in our area. And I can train all the marine mammal parts of it, but knowing that they can do science and that they're comfortable on the water and are good writers, that usually is the, the big part of the battle of getting a successful graduate student. Yeah, thank you. And how do you recommend for students to get into this field? It's a good question, but I I think in a lot of cases it's changing Um, in recent years. In the past, when I was first coming up in the field, it was all about who you know and what experiences you could get by volunteering or interning. And so you had to be able to financially afford those opportunities. And so it wasn't available to everyone. And I think there's been a push in the marine mammal science community recently to try and shift that and make it more accessible. So for example, at UNF, every summer we have a research experiences for undergraduate student program in coastal biology, where the students are actually paid by the National Science Foundation to come and work with us. And so we have a group of faculty that mentor these students over the summer. And so I encourage students to look into that. If you're interested in research, whether it's marine mammal science or neuroscience, look into the National Science Foundation's research experience for undergrads, it's REU programs. And that's a great way for you to have a stipend where you don't have to worry about living expenses or anything and you can get those skills. But it's all about having hands-on experience. And you can do that at your universities as well. Reach out to your faculty members. Ask if you can help out in their labs if they have any data that they need entered. Any type of um, experience that you can get is going to be a step in the right direction. Thank you so much. And as we're almost at the end of our podcast, our signature question is about doing the impossible. What did you think about as impossible in your work with dolphins in your research that actually became possible? And what helped you to make this impossible possible? That's a tough question. Um, So I would say the first thing that comes to mind may not be exactly what you're looking for, but just thinking about being able to make it in the field of marine mammal science, because I know personally, when I started college, I was friends with at least four other young women that wanted to be marine mammal biologists. And a lot of people will say, oh, that's not possible, or that's not a real career option. There's so limited opportunities in that field. You should pick something else. You're you're intelligent. You're good at school. You should do something different. And I am just one of those stubborn people that never listen (laughs) to them. And so out of those four women, I'm the only one that continued to pursue marine mammal science. And The advice that I gave to myself was that if somebody's doing that job, it might as well be me. 
And so I took every step that I possibly could to put myself in a position where I would be likely to get opportunities. And so, for example, as an undergraduate student, I did an internship every winter break and every summer break to try and network and make connections and build that skill set. Um, I tried to get as good of a grade point average as I possibly could to make myself competitive for scholarships and PhD positions. And I know that there's a lot of luck along the way. And I am 100% positive that I was just extremely fortunate that the year that I applied for the PhD program at Georgetown, she was accepting a student because that's not always the case. And if I had applied the year after, I wouldn't have ended up there. And so there is some luck involved, but I think doing everything that you possibly can to put yourself in the best circumstances possible um, will help you and to not give up along the way. When it comes to the sort of research itself, what are some of the hardest things? For me, it's always been figuring out how to quantitatively illustrate what we're seeing out on the water. So for example, knowing that we have these male alliances, we can see that in real time. We watch these males team up and guard a female. We watch other males come in. We watch them fight. We watch them sometimes steal the female. So we can see that all happening, but finding the quantitative tools to be able to, to prove that to other scientists has always been challenging and tricky, um, but there's been a lot of advances in recent years. Um, there's some software that has come out that has been really helpful. So yeah, it's just knowing that they are very complicated animals to study and nothing is ever going to go according to plan. You may start off with an idea and you end up doing something totally different because that's where the animals and the data led you. And just being really flexible and willing to roll with that has been a key part of our being successful as a research team. Thank you so much for sharing that. And what would be the best way to learn about what you do and to maybe contact you for those who might be interested in joining this field or just learning more about the things you do? Sure. We have a research website. So if you just Google UNF Dolphin Research, it should take you right there. Um, and we have a lot of information about our research methods, as well as the dolphins themselves and the type of work that we do. And it has links to all of our publications. So that's a good place to start. If you want to follow along and kind of get a feel for what it's like to be part of the research team, you can also look at our Facebook page. So if you just look on Facebook for UNF Dolphins, we try to do a post every time we go out on the water about anything new or exciting or interesting that we saw while we were out there. And we have lots of fun photos to share, lots of cute baby dolphins. And so that's a great way for people to connect with the research team. And so my email address is in both locations. And so people should be able to find me fairly easily. Thank you so much. And we will add all that information to our podcast now so that people can find. So I don't understand correctly that you have some volunteering opportunities as well for people. I do, but currently right now, we have such an interest from UNF students that all of my volunteering opportunities are taken by undergraduate university students. And so if you are a UNF student interested in getting research experience, just reach out to me. I guarantee I can find an opportunity that will fit for you and your needs and your schedule. If you are not a UNF student, you can still reach out to me, especially if you're interested in graduate school opportunities or just career advice. I'd be happy to answer questions that you might have there. Thank you so much. And I want to encourage people who want to pursue this field, but are hesitant to really give themselves a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And what actually inspired me to do my PhD, which I didn't think about, I didn't consider, uh, I was doing my master's, but I was at the visual science lab and one of the seminars that I participated in, it was about the deep sea 
vision research. So people actually were, it was marine biologists who were going to the mm -hmm. sea, to the, to the ocean and studying deep fish. I was so fascinated by that, that I became a neuroscientist. <laughs> because of course, vision, you know, and all the nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, so even if students who are interested, they may not find themselves exactly in the marine biology field, but it will bring them to what really become something uh, they might be fascinated their whole life. So uh, explore and pursue the opportunities. This is what I wanted to say. And we almost ended our podcast. If there is anything that you want to tell our students, any advice you want to give uh, before we end the podcast. Yes, I think you just gave some great advice. And I would say, explore your options. When you're an undergraduate student, that is the perfect time to look at all of the different areas that you are interested in and don't rule anything out. Get experience. Go try it out for a day. See if you can shadow one of your professors doing their research because you never know what is going to sort of click with you and what you're going to find as your passion. And if you can find a way to make your passion your career, that's the goal, right? That's what everybody wants. You want to study something that you are excited to, to work on every day. And I, I hope that all of you are able to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibson. It was a great pleasure to have you on our podcast. I wish you all possible success with your amazing research. I hope to see you again on our podcast, maybe in a couple of years and learn more. And maybe you already will learn also more about the, this complex behavior that you are trying to study. So I hope it's not our last time that we're meeting together. So thank you again. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here.